Hello, this is Gary Van Wormerdam with the Awareness and Consciousness podcast from PathwayToHappiness.com. And uh, I am visiting with my friend, John Glanville. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. And by here, I mean in your home. <laughs> <laughs> You're downstairs, I'm upstairs. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me here. Hey, you're very welcome. You're very welcome on a, a rainy summer's day in England. <laughs> yeah, we're here enjoying the weather. <laughs> okay, I've been wanting to talk to you a long time and get and pick your brain uh, and get you on the show because I feel that you, well, you are helping a lot of people and uh, I want to get your message out and some of your insights out and your experience out because it helps people. And so what I want to cover in the interview is your story, because I think that's really valuable for people to, to know you can feel really bad and be in a lot of, and in your case, anxiety and OCD issues, and you can change it. You can get better. Yeah. And some of the key things that you did to do that, that helped some key things that you would <laughs> may, may have made it worse or didn't help and why and uh and so yeah just just for people to know it's like oh i don't have to be stuck there is possible i think is is huge to have hope okay. so uh start with what was what age what was anxiety like uh and how did that go on and what were you dealing with in that front? sure sure um It's hard to remember back to being young for me. I don't have, uh, I don't remember really, really early ages. And much of my childhood, I, I really don't remember. Um, but when I think back to my childhood, I um, it was very awkward. It was an awkward childhood. I had lovely parents, and 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 and, um, but I, I felt like an alien in my own family, and um, very self conscious, and uh, everything I. I did, I was very self-conscious of what I wore or what I touched and I wanted everything to be neat and tidy and perfect. And that sort of gave me a protection from the fear I had out there. And I think in my early years, I I never really learned how to play. I was I was so serious about everything and uh, I would turn everything into, into quite a drama and I had a, a terrible temper. So if I couldn't control anything, I would just angrily fly off the handle. And I think by the age of about 10 or 11, I managed to sort of temper it and keep it under control. But it left me in my mind feeling very, very um, uh, worried and anxious about the world, which is kind of funny because my mum was worried and anxious and she was always saying, careful, John, careful, don't do this, don't do this, don't let people down, be nice, be good. And my dad was on the other hand saying, oh, don't worry about it, it'll be fine, don't worry. You know, is it? So I had these, these two worlds in front of me and I didn't know which one was right and which one was wrong. <laughs> so, prob uh, that probably was confusing. Oh, very confusing. And um, because I spent more time with my mum, I sort of sided with her. Well, it must be a really scary world if my mum is scared. Um, and my dad's obviously missing something because my mum was always angry at my dad because he wouldn't he wouldn't be serious. And, 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 and my dad would say, oh, don't worry, that'll sort itself out. And my mum would say, no, you're not taking this, you're not taking this um, seriously. This is a bad thing. Yeah. My dad would say, well, it'll just pass. Don't worry about that. Okay. So, and I'm not being horrible to my mum. I have a most wonderful mum. But um, it was confusing to me because uh, if you let, let things go and you didn't worry and you were fun and happy, it was seemingly a bad thing. <laughs> uh, and you should have to worry and control everything. So it left me in a very confused state. Although at that age, I didn't know I was confused. I just looked at the world and it just seemed so frightening and alien to me. Now, even though I had obvious um, anxiety, self-esteem, self-consciousness issues from a very, very young age, I could still function. I could still go to school. I could still do things. But it was so constrained and I had to think and worry about all the things that could go wrong and I needed to come home at the end of the day and I had all these sort of OCD things I had to do I had to tidy things and clean things and um, 
as a way of sort of calming myself down and sort of placating myself. But at the time, back in the the, the 60s and 70s, I nobody really knew what OCD was. And even anxiety was a, a funny thing that Aunt Flo had. Um, um, so I sort of, I functioned and I got on and I got on and I got on. And to me, I just thought I was a bit crazy and a bit a bit weird. And um, and then as I got older into my uh, late teens and I started working and I could still go and function and do everything, but I just felt an alien in my own environment. Um, and I would look at how the world worked and it didn't make sense to me. Okay. And I um give me give me an example of that. Yeah. Um I mean, I, I had a similar sense of yeah, well I can I could in hindsight I can answer it in a different way by saying in my mid-30s, I suddenly realized that I had a very complex personality. Okay. And my particular type of complex personality has the ability to look at life from 10,000 feet, see all the things that are happening. And then my unconscious brain can piece it all together unconsciously and then feed to my conscious mind a story that says that will work or that won't work. But I couldn't tell you why it would work or why it wouldn't work because it's done unconsciously. And apparently, if you listen to all the psychologists, um, that's not uncommon, but it's quite rare. So I would be looking at two people talking and I'd be thinking, why are they talking about that thing? Because the obvious thing you need to do is this. Yeah, because my unconscious mind was saying, well, that, that won't work. But if I said to them that won't work, they would say to me, why won't it work? And I couldn't consciously tell them because my unconscious was just saying that won't work. And my unconscious had all the workings, but my conscious mind didn't have the workings. So I, they would say, why won't it work? And I say, I don't know, it just won't work. And then, so they would then ignore me because I couldn't tell them. Then they would go and do that thing and it wouldn't work. And meanwhile, and then, I say, well, why didn't you tell us? And I said, I did tell you. And they said, no, but you didn't tell us why. And I said, well, I didn't know yeah. why. It was just intuition. And now you're somewhat alienated. You're ostracized. You are yeah. don't feel like you don't fit in because you don't have this communication language that they're looking for. Things yeah. like that start to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I had this sort of, and this is not like a, um, a magical ESP thing. I think I just have a, an unconscious brain that takes lots of information in, joins all the dots and then feeds it to my conscious mind. Um, but because not, I couldn't answer people's questions of how I felt and why I was thinking and why I was worried, my mum used to say to me, are you going to that party at the weekend with your little friends from school, you know, when you're 12 or 13? And I'd say, no, I don't want to go. And they, and, and she said, well, why don't you want to go? And I said, because it's a fancy dress, but it's a dress up party. Right. And I don't want to dress up. I just feel, I feel, I, I feel so out of control if I dress up that I, that I don't want to go. And she'll say, well, just go in your normal clothes. And I said, well, I can't go in my normal clothes because they'll all be dressed up, okay? And I, and I feel bad for not being dressed up, but I don't want to be dressed up. And I had all these strange things in my head where I, I didn't want to look stupid and I didn't want to embarrass myself. And I I don't know where it came from, but it was, it was strong within me. And that sort of led me to trying to be perfect in everything I did, which once again, and that makes sense from a young kid who's trying to, avoid things going wrong and try to be liked and everything else um but obviously it gets in the way of happiness and calmness and choice and spontaneity and fun and and all those things so i was a very serious child so this perfection this is where the compensating side is is develops into an ocd yeah 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 kind of okay yeah. um and then as I went through all my 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 uh, my training as an engineer and then sort of working in, in engineering worlds, um, a funny thing happened is that everything I did, I was reasonably good at, okay? So other people would say, oh, John's good at that, we'll make him the manager, or John's good at that, we'll make him the boss of this, or John's good at that, we'll, we'll put him in that department and he can start that new project. So obviously everybody could see that I was an intelligent guy and everyone could see that I was competent, but I felt a complete fraud because in my head, that wasn't the story that I was running. I was this freak who, who had all this anxiety and all this OCD that I didn't tell anybody about. 
and I'd have to run off to the bathroom and wash my hands or I'd have to run home and clean my kitchen or I'd have to run lots of uh, stories in my head to calm myself down. Um, and nobody knew about that. So, I, And back then, nobody talked about OCD in the 70s and 80s. It was, wasn't even a, a thing and there was no internet and there was no books on it. So all I thought was I was mad. I thought I was mad and weird and broken. And how can all these people see something in me that is funny a useful productive um and 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 completely foreign to what you feel about yourself i think probably your sense of yourself or our sense of ourself is is anchored so much in how we feel yeah yeah that that is the definition of what we are we are our, our narratives come out of how we feel about ourselves and that's not you are feeling pure fear completely I, I, time, I, so. fear exhaustion numbness shame Shame, guilt. guilt, embarrassment, uh, uh, okay, imposter kind of syndrome sort of thing. Right, yeah. Plus, I had lots of intrusive thoughts. Some were of a sexual nature and some were of a harming nature to harm people, um, which is kind of funny because I'm five oh. foot two and I weigh 130 <laughs> pounds, like, I, like I'm going to harm somebody. Okay, but, okay. Um, get get into this intrusive yeah. thoughts and harming things because we, we talked about this and we were laughing about this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, people people who have these, they're scared of themselves. Yeah, I, I remember it, it wasn't until, because I had my, I had anxiety as a kid till about, well, from from about, I don't know, eight or nine. And then the OCD crept in at about 12 years old. And the whole thing stayed with me until I was 35. I didn't get any help till I was 35 years old. Um, and I was really high functioning. I ended up being a sales director for a software company. I was traveling all around the world, setting up businesses all around the world, still feeling like an imposter, still feeling like I, I shouldn't be doing those things and wondering why everybody was uh, uh, liking me and respecting me uh, until I had a complete mental breakdown when I was 35 and spent um, uh, six months in bed, just wondering how I will ever work again um, and have a complete a meltdown and people call it uh, waking up don't they and, and maybe I did wake up at that time and maybe I needed to go through that hell to get to a new place um but for seven of those years uh I was traveling around the world and I couldn't go into um hotel breakfast buffets where you help yourself to uh your food you get in a queue and you get your plate and your, your knives and forks and you help yourself to the food and you go and sit down again because I thought that if I was holding a knife and fork or some chopsticks, I would stab the person in front of me repeatedly through their back, okay? Um, or smash my plate and slash their neck with the, uh, the crockery, of, you know, <laughs> with the jagged edge. And um, sitting here telling this story, it, it's hilarious because I would never do that. But back then I had this thought that I might. Well, you had to, because you, your, your mind is just, offering up that option it's like here's here's one of a billion things that we could do or that could happen and if you're identified with what your mind screen is showing you and say oh i am that person yeah that it feels like i could do that and now you're scared of this thing that your mind showed you as an option yeah 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 which and, and we identified with the person on the mind screen that could do you know that's displayed instead of the person like, no, I'm afraid of doing that. I don't want to do that instead of like identifying there, which is actually stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the time it just freaked the life out of me because I yeah. thought, Oh my God, I'm going at, mad. And mad people do this sort of thing at the, t at the time for, for, and for years, seven years, yeah, intrusive absolutely. thoughts like this. And harm I, I would, I would, um, it was, it was less bad if I was traveling with somebody because I could, I could sort of be with them and it would sort of stop me from almost thinking that if I started to do something stupid, they would stop me. Okay. Um, but if I was on my own, I, I thought, well, there's, there's, there's no governance here. There's nothing to stop this madness from happening. So I would um, order room service from my breakfast, from my hotel room. Um, and when the, when the guy knocked on the door with my breakfast, I would lock myself in the bathroom, lock the door. And so he come in, and he would come in, and obviously I couldn't attack him because I was in the bathroom with the door locked. And then he would leave the leave the food there, and he would go off, and then I would, like Billy No Mates, I would eat my breakfast in my, my hotel room, safe in the knowledge that I wouldn't murder anybody. Feeling really stupid about it, but at the same time feeling good because I haven't killed anybody. Um, <laughs> and... It was really real back then. It was it was real to me, and it was the world I lived in, and it's what I believed. And I, but I could still function. 
but it was exhausting and it made me have to lie and it made me have to pretend I didn't have this problem. So I would go into, into, you know, doing business across Asia. I'd have to take people out for lunch and, um, uh, and they'd like to go to a local noodle bar or something where everybody's walking around. And I, I could just about manage a sit down meal where we were given service and nobody walked around because there was a chance that I wouldn't kill anybody. So I had to kind of talk people into go to a certain restaurant and oh, it was just a complete exhausting nightmare. And I honestly thought that I was just mad and there was no way out of it. <laughs> and um, slowly over time, it just exhausts you and exhausts you and exhausts you. And then you try harder and harder to be better and better to compensate for the fact that you think that they must know that you're a fake and you're, you're you know, you're, you're messed up. Uh, and ultimately, um, it did a couple of things for me. Um, one of the things I talk about in my work, you know, working with anxiety and OCD, is that um, anxiety and OCD exhaust you. And the more exhausted you become, the more your own biology, your own unconscious sorts to hijack you, to pull you away from life and make you stay at home with the view that if you're at home, you can recharge, you can biologically you know, get yourself back together again, which kind of makes sense, but it's unconscious. And it's yeah, sort of we're tired and in a certain aspect, we need to rest and recover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to do that in safety. However, yeah, that's not what happened, I suspect. Yeah, and the unconscious is sort of, it's clever and it's running the show but it's only really as clever as about an eight-year-old in the complexity of the strategies that it uses to pull you away from the crap that you're in that is making you biologically exhausted. So for me, what it was saying is if I scare the life out of him when he's in a hotel, he'll stop going in hotels. Yeah? And if he can't go to hotels, he can't do that job. And if he can't do that job good because they'll fire him and he can stay at home and then he will relax and then he can recharge and that's what he wants so you can see at one level the unconscious with the logic of an eight-year-old was doing the most sensible thing for my biology but my advanced thinking conscious intellect was saying oh my god i need this job i need the money you know i need to be the best at this which was further fueling the actual exhaustion and the conflict within myself so i sort of learned to manage this fear of killing people and just plow through it i just bulldozed through the whole thing and i uh to be honest i don't know what i did i just i just got on with yeah. it so but it went on for years you're exhausted you you crashed so you and then like, as i got stuck more, at home. before i crashed as i got more and more exhausted and more and more yeah this is a great job but this is not really what i want to do there's got to be more to life than this. It was very corporate. I, I was doing loads of things I didn't want to do. And as a director of the company, you're firing people and hiring people. And it's, it's stressful, you know. And, um, and I think if you're a, a nice person, it's even more stressful because you, you want to be nice to everybody, but your job is to manage and to direct. And actually, with that comes a lot of responsibility. And sometimes you have to be harsh and just, you know, in someone's face. And um, the nice part of me struggled with that at the time. So as I got closer and closer to my mental breakdown, more and more exhausted, what my little unconscious little eight-year-old started to do was saying, well, we tried to make you too scared to travel in hotels by using that strategy of you're going to kill someone. We need to bring in another strategy. So they brought in another strategy that every time I got on an airplane, I started having panic attacks, which was kind of hilarious because... I love flying. I know how airplanes work. I'm an engineer. I think they're fantastic, you know. Um, never got, never was scared of going on an airplane before. But now, every time we were about to take off and land, I would have full-blown panic attacks. And I'm thinking something must be wrong. It, it can't just be anxiety because I'm okay with flying. So it must be a heart attack. It must be something else that's wrong with me. But all it was was my little eight-year-old, my unconscious, saying, you're exhausted. I'm going to sabotage you. If I make it so you can't fly, you won't be able to do your job. If you can't do your job, you'll be fired. If you're fired, you'll stay at home and you can just recharge. It's just, it's just how, it's how the unconscious works. Yeah, but solving solving the problem of getting something we it, we want or need with an eight-year-old logic. Completely. And then so I keep flying, keep pushing myself and keep pushing myself. We're being exhausted, <laughs> fighting exhausted through myself. Myself. Yeah. So my unconscious then said, okay, we got to come up with something else because these two strategies haven't worked. We need to bring another one in, okay? And so, Your override capability is phenomenal. Yeah. So to them what it brought in was um, 
every time I drove my car, and I love driving my car, and uh, I used to race go-karts and things, so very comfortable driving, love driving. What my little unconscious eight-year-old sabotage started to do is it started to make me freak out when I went on a um, a dual carriageway or a motorway or a freeway, anywhere there's more than two lanes, I would start to panic. Anywhere where you couldn't get off the motorway, I would, as I was driving, I would feel dissociated. So I knew why I was driving, but I, I don't know, I felt like I wasn't driving and I felt like I couldn't control it. And it just started to freak me out. So it got to the point where I, I could only drive on single lane roads with no dual carriageways, okay, where you could always decide to go a different direction or you could stop. Yeah? So I just I stopped going on, 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 on freeways and that just caused so many other problems in my life. It's, um, it's fascinating how we adapt yes. to, oh, here's a fear. Uh, I, I can't go to the buffet line and I'll go through this thing of ordering breakfast in and lock myself in the bathroom while it's delivered. It's like we do this extra work that is adapting, but not solving the problem. You know, you have you have the fear of uh, driving on certain roads. You're like, well, I'll adapt and I'll go on these other roads. Like we adapt, we make extra effort, but yeah. we don't solve the problem. Like yeah. what's actually the source of this fear? So we're responding we start, to the symptoms. We respond we, to the symptoms as we see them, but we're not looking at the cause. Yeah, and now we have to clean everything all the time and we have to, and, and we're putting all these layers on top of extra work. Yeah instead of bringing our attention to, which is now keeping our attention and our mind busy and our energy busy, yes. so much so that it's distracting us from, well, what's the source of this? Completely. I mean, looking back on it, I couldn't see it at the time because no. I had no frame of reference. I I didn't really even know what I had. I just thought I was weird, weird and messed up. I, 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 you, you don't go through the library looking for the book for weird and messed up people. It's just, yeah, and you don't, and you don't want to tell anybody, hey, I feel this and I think these thoughts because no. that's incredibly shameful, and we don't want people to think that we're crazy and get yeah. locked up, and we certainly don't want a therapist to do it because they'll lock us up. So let's hide all this stuff from everybody. Yeah. Uh, so if I could put it into words, you know, metaphorically looking back on it just before I crashed out, it was like my my unconscious mind was saying, you are exhausted. You're not doing what you need to do. I can't, you know, you, I, you're making me ill. I have to sabotage you. And the sabotage will come from my unconscious. Therefore, it will happen to you, you know, from your conscious perspective, it will be happening to you and you won't know where it's coming from because it's coming from your unconscious, okay? And, um, and then consciously, I was saying, oh my God, what's wrong with me? How can I protect myself against these things? And you know, you, you, I just, I just lost the plot, and I just become completely exhausted, and I couldn't work, and I was, I was off, off work for six months, and I just, I thought my life was over. I thought there's no way I would work again, uh, and I would lose this great job that I had, and it was a great job because it paid loads of money, and there was a car, and there was a pension, but it was making me sick and making me ill, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. Although I didn't know what I did want to do, you know, which is a big problem most people face um, Interest, interesting you just touched on this other point of you know all of this is going on and you're describing it as your unconscious was doing this to you but that's not how we think of it at the time we think oh there's something wrong with me i'm messed up i'm broken you know we we don't we we and mentioned this this morning over breakfast really how do one of the critical things you have to shift this narrative and say oh it's not me that's messed up my unconscious is trying to send me a message. It's got something it's signaling. I have fear and the fear is not me. And I have shame and the shame is not me. And we have to break this paradigm that's like, I'm all those parts and recognize like, in a way, disidentify and see them as like, oh, these are different aspects of my being doing what they're doing. Yeah. And I might be okay, but they need some help. Yeah. But back then I, I had no... No, no, we have no... Friends. I just thought I am me and, you know... I'm having these thoughts. Yeah, so then we have, and this is, and, and this if I is can't part stop of those mind. thoughts. Then I'm mad because, yeah, my yeah. thoughts. I should yeah. be able to stop them. And this um, is, and this is the kind of model that you have to step out of and try on different things. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. broke down, and I don't know where did where did you start doing things? And I know you got to a therapist who who helped you. On, yeah, so you yeah, broke I down, did. and and what was that process to like? Okay, I got to go get some help. Yes, yeah, so I I broke down and. um 
I just couldn't get out of bed. I was in bed for six months and I'd, I'd get out of bed to go and clean my kitchen, which is the last thing I did three hours before I went to bed. Um, <laughs> and as I'm cleaning my kitchen, I'm thinking this is bloody stupid. Um, but I couldn't not do it because if I didn't do it, I'd be in bed being overwhelmed. And if I did do it, I would calm down, even though I knew it was stupid. So, um, and of course, that, that led to another thing that I, I can only now talk about after working with complex anxiety and OCD for the last 20 years, you know, helping people. And being free of it myself, or mostly free of it myself. Um, back then, while I was, let's say, there's lots of things I had to do. But if we use cleaning my kitchen as one example, I had to clean it until it either felt clean or that the voice in my head said it was clean enough. Okay. And sometimes it was an hour and sometimes it was three hours. Okay. And sometimes that feeling of it's clean enough took half an hour. And, and sometimes that never came. And in the end, you, you had to stop cleaning because, I don't know, you've been doing it for six hours and, the, you know, you just had to go to bed or you had to go to work. So uh, in hindsight, it, it taught me that there is no thinking that is the regulator of what is good in, or bad enough. And there is no feeling that is the, the regulator of what is good and bad enough. But people with anxiety and OCD, they they think there is. I will wash my hands until it feels like they're clean. Well, what's that feeling? It's just, you know, it's, it's a it's it's, yeah. it's not there, you know. Yeah, uh, that's not so, where the feeling's coming from. It's not coming yeah. from washing your hands. So exactly, you know, and if, yeah, but expecting it to is is just keeps yeah. you in the loop. And if yeah. the if the voice in your head says your hands are not clean yet, how does it know? How do you know it's not clean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would look clean to me. But at the time, they feel so real. Um, but that's just a trap of anxiety and OCD. Yeah. But I can only say that now, looking back on it. At the time, it was also real that you, you, you're consumed by your thoughts and your feelings, or should I say the thoughts and the feelings. Um, okay. Back then, I thought they were my thoughts and my feelings. Yeah. Uh, but really, they're yeah. just the body. And of a body that's deregulated out of calibration, over over conditions with fear and blah, 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 all the usual stories. Okay, so what was what was some of the things you used to, you, I think you mentioned the therapist was your first kind of... Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I, this is, I've got a chance. I can change I, this. I, I met a couple of therapists and um, at that time when I was starting to break down, I was getting kind of interested in language patterns. I was interested in hypnosis. I was interested in um, clean use of language. And I was interested in how you might influence people through language. So I was reading lots of books on that purely to make me a better salesperson doing my job I hated doing, okay? Um, so I just thought, well, these, these seem like very good skills. Maybe I can influence people. And I never really thought that I could use them on myself. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> but as I <laughs> as I started to uh, deteriorate into this mental breakdown, I um, I saw a few therapists, and they they never had a they never had really bad anxiety. They didn't have complex personalities, and they they had never worked with OCD, and so you'd say something to them about what was happening to you and you could see them glaze over thinking, Oh shit, I don't know what to do here. Okay. Um, and I, um, so I saw them a couple of times and it didn't work for me. And finally I, I, um, I found a guy in North London and ironically he, he was an engineer who became a therapist because yeah, he could, he had anxiety, but he couldn't get any help. So he figured it out himself and he fixed himself. And, uh, I say it's ironic because I'm an engineer who became a therapist and you're an engineer who became kind of a therapist. So there's a, there's a, I think, I think engineers make very good therapists. Okay. Um, we'll break it. We're going to break it down to core, core sources and first principles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we want to know. Okay. We're going to, we're going to be thorough. We are going to be, we are going to be thorough. Give me the, give me the math behind it. Give me the physics. Okay. Cause then if I can understand it, I can do something with it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I started working with him and he he was he was genius he was genius and he was genius with common sense and he would just give me these common sense ways to look at everything okay and i would walk out of his office going but oh, that's so bloody obvious why did no one tell me that 
Why did my doctor not tell me that? Okay. And he was just saying, well, uh, you're not your thoughts. I said, what do you mean you're not your thoughts? And he says, well, if you were your thoughts, you would say thoughts stop and they would stop, but they don't stop. Okay. But they're not your thoughts. And then he would say, and your thoughts don't have any meaning. I'd say they do. And he, and he said, no, they don't. I said, they do. If, he, if my thoughts say I'm an idiot, then obviously I'm an idiot. And he'd say, no, you're an idiot if you believe a thought that says you're an idiot, because obviously you're a sales director for this software company. You're obviously not an idiot. OK, so and, and, that, and so every, everything I said, he could just break apart in a really funny way. Right. And I think I think therapy and personal growth, it should be funny and it should be done in a funny way. Oh, good. If we can laugh at the, the, some of the crazy thinking we have, it'll go all, a whole lot faster. Yeah, otherwise yeah. you'd be oh, yeah. a on the floor sobbing all day long, wouldn't you? You've yeah. got yeah. uh, to laugh at yourself at, at some point. At the, the, the stupidity, the folly of what well, we do to ourselves. Well, particularly laugh at your own thinking because most of it's, and I and I say that from most of my thinking is nonsense. So I long ago I stopped believing it. It's like, well, it just shows yeah. different options. I don't have to choose and believe any of them until yeah. I pick, find what I like. Yeah. And I remember one of the first things he said to me, he said to me, um, we've been about four or five sessions in and I was really liking him. And he said to me, he's write down on his uh, piece of paper, he said, this is a book I want you to read. OK, and when you come back next week, we'll talk about what you made of reading that book and how we can apply that to your life. And um, I said, OK, so as I left his house, I go to the bookstore and I buy the book. I drive home and that night I would read the book <laughs> and I'd read the whole book <laughs> and then I'd ring him up the next day <laughs> and said, right, I've read that book. What's next? Because I've got another six days before I see you. I, I, what's the next book I need to read? <laughs> and he would just laugh. <laughs> he would just laugh. And he'd say, well, don't read another book. Ponder that book. I said, well, I've read it. I don't need to ponder it. I've read it. I've taken it. I'm a fast learner. And he went, no, 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 no. I said, John, your conscious mind has taken in that book, but your unconscious will only take in all the stories when you consciously keep repeating the behaviors that are taught in that book. So what you're doing is you're going, oh, I consciously get it, but you're not living it, okay? You're just assuming that your unconscious consciously gets it, but it doesn't because your unconscious is just a series of programs that run over and over again which is why we do the same stupid things every day, even though we got all this information. He said, you've got to use your conscious mind to retrain the unconscious mind over and over again with lots of repetition until that repetition becomes the new story and the new program that runs in your unconscious mind. And he said to me, I'm not going to give you another book until you come next week. And then I'll give you the other book. But when you come to your session next week, I'm going to ask you, from that book you just read on day one, on the next six days, how many times did you do the things in the book over and over and over again to try and reprogram your unconscious mind? And that's the first time anybody had ever said anything like that to me. And as an engineer, I said, that kind of makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know? Um, you're gonna yeah, because how do, you, how do you get into the software program, the operating system in the background? Completely. That's running on automatic because that's 95 percent yeah. of our behavior usually is automatic programming like okay how does that change and you got the key, one of the keys repetition yeah repetition so then i would go along and then i would tell him about all the stories of me doing this repetition and what i found okay and that by the end of the week some of my unconscious thoughts had changed i remember the first time it happened because i had a real negative thoughts i'd say oh yeah i'll go and do that thing consciously and my unconscious would say oh no you can't do that all the time or you better make sure you know what you're doing before you do it uh practice before you go out there it would always be careful 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 and i was gonna go and do something i was gonna meet somebody for um for lunch and um my unconscious mind went oh yeah that'll be fun right and i i sort of oh where did i come from like there was uh, there was a a nice <laughs> thing came up oh. in my a, a shocking, nice thought, a glitch in the matrix, like what changed? Yeah, but in the week before, I can't remember what book it was, but the book said for every negative thought you have that comes from your unconscious, consciously give five thoughts back that are positive and loving, even if you don't believe it. So if it says you're an idiot, you might say, well, I love you, I love you, you're wonderful, you're clever, you're really smart. 
He said, I don't care if you believe it or not, but you're going to say it and you're going to say it in a way as if it's true. So the unconscious says, you're an idiot. Consciously, you don't go, no, I'm not. I'm wonderful. You say, <laughs> actually, I'm really clever. You know, actually, yeah. I'm, I'm really competent. Actually, I'm a really good person. Right. He said, there's I'm so, really there's it. so, there's so much in that tone, the belief, yeah. the faith. That's the energy that can program the mind. The reaction doesn't. It's action kind of reinforces it in a way like now you have an argument in your head instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's got to, it's got to be yeah. congruent in as much as if you did mean it, that's how you would say it. Yeah. You know, um, so I, so that was was that like that nice thought? Oh, that'll be nice. Was that the first sign of hope? Was, I mean, because you still first, remember it. This is yeah, this I still remember. It, yeah. it was my first sign of oh, I, 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 well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can be nice to myself. That's weird. <laughs> and I, mean, I like that. I like that. Where did that come from? Okay. And then I, and I wanted like, more of those. And then like, yeah, how do I do that again? Yeah, how do we do that? Immediately, as soon as I went, oh, that's good. I'll come up, yeah, but that's just that's just luck. That shouldn't have happened. You're still an idiot. That, all, all the old stories still, we're still there. Then so, I got to put five more on each one of those. <laughs> I put a lot of effort in, and and I really tried hard. Um, and there was a little sign. There's a little sign that because you know, I was really doubtful because. You know, even though this guy's saying I used to have anxiety, I don't have it anymore. If you do these things, it will work. I still didn't believe him. I still, I was such a pessimist. And perhaps we can bring that up later on, pessimism and optimism. I was a pessimist looking for all the things that could go wrong in life. And I believed, to another belief system, you know, you do a lot of work with belief systems. Um, I believed that I was born a pessimist. Therefore, poor me, I will always be pessimistic. It's like, I was born an introvert, therefore, poor me, I will always be introverted. And nobody ever told me that optimism is a skill that you can learn, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I know, I know you today, and like, that, that that's who you were, <laughs> that, and that was your limited mindset. It's just, like, mind-boggling to me, you know? Yeah, I'm really optimistic. <laughs> and, and you know with you are today. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and and back then I'm a pest, I'm a I'm an introvert, so I'm quiet and shy. Therefore, if I do anything loud, it will be uncomfortable. And now, actually, I'm I'm still I'm still an introvert, but I can I've learned how to do extrovert. Yeah. But the, all that means is I've got a greater range of um, skills. You know, and I prefer these ones, but I can do those ones. And the more I do those ones, the easier it becomes because it makes me a more rounded person. So it really broke the stories in my mind. And we talk about the mind as well. It broke stories in my mind that um, who you are is fixed, and that's your lot. And I was shocked at how programmed we have been, how conditioned we have been, and how programmable we are to change, and how we can consciously program our own unconscious mind quite amazingly to have profound changes within ourselves. Um, so I then just became fixated with learning how you reprogram yourself and then pushing myself into situations that would make me feel uncomfortable so that I could learn how to calm myself down. OK, and then um, handle that situation, oh, which is exposure you were, therapy. You're interesting. Oh, you would then push yourself into situations intentionally yeah. to be uncomfortable so you could practice and get better at calming yeah. yourself. Yeah. So yeah. when I was in the beginning, That's when I was just, laying in bed. But, I, but first you needed to be able to get a certain base level. I can call yeah. myself in a simple yeah. home situation. I can regulate this. I can change this. Oh, I can internally change how I feel. And then I'll go do it in these situations and incrementally get better at it. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, this is the any way that somebody realistically practice instead of thinking, oh, I have to speak to 500 people. Like, oh, I need to go be calm and present there. It's like, no, you need to, yeah. you can't start at that leap at that level. Yeah. But, okay. So, and there was, a, there was a bit you shared about that therapist who gave you these books. And then you went back and I know like every week he gave you a book. He was giving you new books all the time. Uh, and then he said he wouldn't give you any books, new books anymore. Yeah. He said, yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I was gobbling up all these books and, um, and then he said to me, I said, what's the next book? What's the next book? 
you know, there's no more books. You've got to go and live all this stuff now. Okay, you've got to, you've got everything you need. Yeah, your 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 ego and your brain is telling you because you currently don't feel like you can go forward and you don't know what you want to do going forward. So your ego is saying you need more information. And when you've got enough information, then you'll be safe to go forward. He said, that's a trap. You've now got enough information. Okay. So what you've got to do now, even though you don't believe or think or feel that you have enough information, you have enough information, go forward, even though you feel you don't. Yeah. And he would say, and how did how did that feel? What was that like to like? Terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> and it was ter- but at the same terrifying. Time, but at the same time, I couldn't argue with him, right? Because he said you could stay at home. I don't know, let's say you was going to go for a job interview. I'm, I'm making this up. Let's say you're going for a job interview in a week's time. Okay, he said you could stay at home or worrying about that job interview all week researching analyzing doing all the things okay and it could be that you're completely stressed yourself out and when you turn up at the interview you're so stressed that you can't think straight okay and you 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 mess it up and they don't give you the job okay or you could just not think about it all week turn up see what happens (laughs) and maybe it'd be good and maybe it'd be bad um and you won't know till you get there and i I would say to him what do you mean how can you I, just, I, I had no framework for just being spontaneous. I, I just, I didn't know what spontaneous, to me, sponta- or to my unconscious, spontaneity was dangerous. If you were spontaneous, you weren't prepared. Anything could go wrong. Okay. <laughs> that was my story. Um, so he would say, I remember him, this is my words, not his words. And I didn't understand it at the time, but now I 100% understand it. He said something like, The thing that gets anxious and OCD people, and I think we can we can use the word anxious and OCD for everybody. There's not a person out there that they may not be an anxious person, but there's things that will make them anxious. I mean, that's just human nature, okay? And I think everybody has OCD to a certain degree. Um, Not that you have to wash your hands or you've got intrusive thoughts, but you know, OCD about how you talk to yourself, OCD, about the silly little things in your life. There's Everybody's got their own little thing of repetition. It's what they're comfortable with. Um, and he said to me, anybody who wants to change will have to embrace ERP, exposure and response prevention therapy. But most people are scared of doing it and they talk themselves out of doing it or they sabotage themselves from doing ERP. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Let's say somebody has a metaphobia, so they're afraid of vomiting, okay? Which is quite a restrictive um, phobia to have. He said, what they should really do is go into the bathroom, put their fingers down their throat and throw up, okay? And they keep doing it and eventually it will become less scary because they're doing it and it's horrible and disgusting, okay? Um, but they will it, will, it will then sort of normalize within them. He said, but if you say to somebody with a metaphobia, go and do that, they'll go, no, no, I couldn't do that. I can't possibly do that. You don't know what it's like. It's good, right? and, and they'll go into a whole panic attack to defend their own limitation, okay? Which is reinforcing it in their body, reinforcing it in their brain. The emotion and the scaredness while they're thinking of vomiting is reinforcing that whole negative yeah, system. The, 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 the loops that they're playing in the fear of it actually is yeah. making it stronger yeah. Yeah. in their whole internal neural pathways and nervous system Completely. yeah as they tell you i can't a self-limiting yep. belief and put faith in it yeah they're arguing for limitations that's in the narrative so all of that's happening so you said so if you think about it you know if you take all the emotion out of it they're hoping or they're wishing to not be scared of vomiting yes it's disgusting yes it's horrible but if it should it happen okay it's disgusting we'll get through it okay that's what that's what they want but they're but not John, doing John, in line with that, with that, with that desire. John, that's a total engineer thing to say. Just take all the emotion out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you have to do as an engineer. You're you're in the factory. Things are exploding. Some things are on fire. Yeah. Going, no. oh, we, we, yeah. Oh, you stay, stay, stay calm. Stay calm. I'm going to start by turning that pump off and see. Yes. Yeah. Stay calm and work the problem. Stay calm and work the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if you say something like a metaphobia, somebody who's scared of vomiting, if you say, well, just go and practice vomiting, that, that's a that's a big freaky thing. And I and I yeah. get how hard 
that is, but it is possible. But you've got to ask the person, is that what you desire? Do you desire to be free from this? And they say, oh yeah, I do. And then I say, well, do you desire to be free from it more than you desire to keep it? And they said, well, of course I do. And I said, okay then, so you've got to do the actions that will allow you to move away from it rather than running the actions that allow you to keep it. And they go, yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah. okay, well, let's do some exposure therapy. Let's put your fingers down your throat and make you vomit. And they go, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So suddenly you can see, yes, they have a conscious desire to change, but they have an unconscious desire to keep it because the unconscious thinks it's keeping them safe, even though that safety is out of date or from a past issue in their life. And this is and this is with everything. I Absolutely. I was at, at the last retreat I did, I, I kind of opened the evening and said, Welcome to the uncomfortable tour. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I said, now no, it's not intended to make you uncomfortable. We're here to have a good time. We're, we're we we want to have real beautiful experiences. We want to let go of all these fears, but we're gonna have to be honest about what's there and and, and emotion's gonna happen. And you know, that part's uncomfortable yeah. in order yeah. to make progress. And so, it's um, something in the, and you have to kind of retrain your mind. It's like, okay, yeah, I've gonna, you know, some people, some people are uncomfortable, like paying to go to an event or paying a therapist. Like, well, I don't want to spend the money. That's uncomfortable. It's like, well, you gotta, you gotta do something that's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, and you're gonna be vulnerable and honest and share something that might be embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. So what it dawned on me, um, and I'm, I'm quite a quick learner, um, and it dawned on me. Um, really early about how much of all the drama in my life I, I was causing or unconsciously causing. And I understood what he's talking about, this exposure therapy. If, if somebody who's scared of vomiting wants to get over it, well, then they've got to expose themselves to vomiting, as horrible as it is, and it will normalize, okay? Um, and then he said, like, he said, that's one extreme. He said, let me give you another example. He said, let's say um, a man is scared to go on a date. Okay, let's just say he's, you know, He's, he's, he's nervous of going on a date, okay? Um, well, yeah, that's that can be appropriate. You know, if, you've got not, if you don't have a lot of skills, if you're scared of women. Me personally, I went to a boys' school when I was 16. I didn't know how to talk to girls. They frightened the life out of me. I had to learn. and We, we get no uh, training in this. No, At least I didn't. No, yeah. me neither. I mean, incredibly staying uncomfortable. away from them is not how you learn. No. Just, it learn. just reinforces the pattern to say you mess up and you mess up, and then you mess up less and you mess up less, and you go, oh, well, now I can do this, okay? It's exposure therapy. Right? And the trouble with exposure therapy is most people with anxiety and OCD don't want to do it, okay? Secondly, they're doing the exposure therapy on their issues, when they should be doing exposure therapy on life. What does that mean? What am I not doing in my life that I ought to be doing that will give me a better life? That is- They're, do, they're doing it, they're doing exposure therapy on their issues instead right, of doing right. exposure therapy on their life. What do I want to be doing or what would I be doing in my life that would give me a better life? Yeah. So let me- And go do that, that even yeah. if that's uncomfortable. So let's say, Let's go back to the emetophobia, fear of vomiting again. The person might say, I can't go to the school to collect my child because the school is full of snotty nosed kids that could infect me or my mm -hmm. children. <laughs> and then I will get some sort of bug that will either make my children throw up, which I hate because I, I, I can't be there for my children if they're throwing up, or it make me throw up. So I will stay away from the school. So their whole life shrinks down to how do I stop getting bugs in from my children or the school? Uh, how do I keep myself away from vomiting? Okay. Yeah. And that becomes their whole life. And maybe their partner has to go to the school to collect the children. Okay. Or maybe uh, their partner has to do something else. Okay. Yeah. Again, so again all this energy consuming yeah. adaptive Very strategies. often they're putting pressure on the relationship. So the partner is moving further and further away having to do all these other things, resenting the first, the first party has got this problem. So you might argue that bringing your attention and doing the exposure therapy on your relationship, which is a much higher 
up the umbrella of, of the problem, you know, in the, the symptoms, okay? Because if your partner leaves you, you're going to have to do all those things, okay? And you're going to be on your own with half the money and half the house, okay? So could you do exposure therapy on your partner or with your partner? So for example, I'll come, I'll walk down to the school with you to pick up the children. You know what I mean? So you're yeah. doing exposure therapy on the life you wish to live and it seems that as you look at what you need from your life and you start exposing yourself to that, it just sort of transcends these symptoms because you're, you're really going to the cause of the problem. And the cause of most people's problem with anxiety and OCD and, and even depression is thinking and worrying too much, biological exhaustion, yeah, the desire to try to control things that are uncontrollable, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you say you say go ahead and you finish the the issues you say thinking and worrying too much but it's certain kinds of thinking it's certain kind of worrying yeah and uh that's that's obvious to say yes yeah, yeah. that's another thing to change yeah or completely um, yeah so i mean and, and the way i approach it is you know you, you start to move into consciousness and then you start to believe that, well, these thoughts don't make any sense. They're nonsense. And you take your faith out. It's like you no longer believe them and they have less and less power and until yeah. they're uh, they're they're just noise in the background. And then after even after that, they fade away. But, yeah. you know, because here's here's a, you could say, well, you're thinking too much, but they aren't even the ones that think it is. They're, they're, their mind is thinking. And, uh, and so here's here's the caveat that always is like okay you gave them that information and the person's mind will often go to oh i know i'm thinking too much i have to stop like they'll make them so they'll punish themselves with that and it's like that's not what we're saying it's like yeah you're thinking too much but you're also believing too much and by the way it's not even you doing the thinking yeah completely and that, so that, that, it's like that's, yeah that's it's not... like you you like you've got to it's nice to give it's like simple but it's not that simple you've got no, like no, oh yeah there's, there's other elements to it it's easy but it's not simple i mean that's a whole podcast in itself just talking yeah. about how the thoughts work yeah but if i just bring it back to me because i can talk knowledgeably about me yeah. i understood what he meant about the exposure therapy yeah and when i sat back and thought not about my problems but thought about the life i wanted even though i didn't believe i could have it the life I wanted was not doing what I was doing in those corporations. Okay. So you started to do exposure therapy on your life. You're like, what's life. the life I wanted? Yeah. What's the relationship? It started to take steps and move that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Who, not who do I want to, what do I want to do, but who do I want to become? Okay. So no matter what I did, how would I do it? And it, it just got me thinking, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. But and I did that, and... Wanted. And did that accelerate the transformation change out of anxiety yeah, for you? Yeah, because every time I thought, well, so for example, um, as I was going through all this work and reading all the books he recommended and everything else, two things became very, very clear to me. Um, and I think I'd always known them, but I'd been in denial of them. And the first thing was that in my nature, I was quite dominant and assertive. But I didn't see myself as a dominant and assertive person. I saw myself as a nice person. So I would be this sort of passive, aggressive, assertive. And I say, I really need you to do this thing if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> so, of course, I would be giving out mixed messages to people. And I was trying to be this nice kind of warrior rather than just a warrior. I went, well, you just bloody do it because I need it done. OK, yeah. and actually, if I'd done it that way, it would have felt more congruous to the other person um, rather than me trying to be this passive aggressive. And I thought to myself, my God, I need to own my my dominance. OK, not to make me a horrible person, but make me a practical. No, but, well, not but you were but myself. you were you were a director of a company. You're also in yeah, charge of yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. Like, let's get stuff done, people. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and, and so what happened is if I had lots of stuff had to get done. It was quicker and safer for me to do it all. OK, because I could control it. I didn't have to boss anybody around. OK, so I was sort of making work for myself, but I could have just delegated it to everybody. Uh, but I was sort of 
I felt out of control. Okay. Mm. Um, it's hilarious now when you look back on it, but these are the games that we play. So I realized I had this dominance that I, that I could use and I should use. And it was okay to use because it was me. What's, when you say dominance, what does that mean for you? I think dominant people I mean, know certain... what they want to happen and they want to control how it happens. If you say to somebody who's not dominant, what should we do? They go, I don't mind. Where should we eat? They go, I don't know. But if you say to like a, a dominant person, you know, where should we go to eat? They say, well, actually, I really like that Indian place down by the, okay. the, the river. Or, All right. So, so you had clear goals, clear processes, and a clear, yeah. clear idea of how things should be done, and kind of a leadership quality. Yeah, way. that was naturally in me, but yeah. I didn't see myself as a natural leader. Okay? Yeah, and this, I, and this and might go back to that. your unconscious seeing the whole picture of how something needed to be done. Yeah, and go well, that'll work or that won't, or that'll, that'll work. Let's do it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That needs to be done. Yeah, I was, always, I was always thinking, what does everybody need? What's what's the best thing for everybody? What's the and, and I would try to and like okay, this needs to happen. Yeah, whereas then go if you don't realized, mind. I suddenly realized no, actually, if this is what I want to do, then this is what I want to do, and actually, and I can do it. I'm allowed to do it, but I I can make those decisions. If I want to change my job, I can change my job. If I want to, and it, yeah. I don't know, and, and the reason and the reason I ask is because that we're dumbness. I mean, it could be like a a, a psychopath and a sociopath. Can yeah, have that no, no, not that, not that way. And and you didn't have it in that way, and that's no, the no, way of like psychopathic. no in a. And there's, there's many ways someone can be dominant. You can be in your face dominant, aggressive warrior dominant. Yeah. You can be gently uh, dominant. Um, yeah. Yeah. I see you're doing that, but I'd rather you didn't. Could you do this, please? Because I, yeah. I would prefer that. Quiet, it, quietly it, calm, expressing yeah. what they want. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's one thing I noticed. Second thing I noticed was, because I was down and low and anxious, I really wanted to be happy. I just think about happy, find, find happiness. And what dawned on me as I went through this process was, no, it's not about happiness. It's about finding calmness. Because from calmness, you could go to anxiety. And from calmness, you can go to happiness. But actually, it's quite exhausting to stay happy and quite exhausting to keep looking for happiness and looking for all the things that will make you happy. But actually calm, when you get really, really calm and good at being calm, at one level, it feels better than being happy. Okay. And I remember the guy talking to me, he said to me, and he was very spiritual, but he never pushed any spirituality on me. And I think if he had at the beginning, I would have rebelled because I didn't know anything about spirituality back then. And I just would have said, no, get back, get back. You're talking about things that can't be proved. And I want to see the facts, <laughs> which was one of my problems at the time. Um, and he was slowly introducing me to a more spiritual way of seeing things without me knowing, which was very sneaky and very clever. And I think, I think that's what I do now in my teachings is I teach, I call it the, the engineer's, <laughs> engineer's guide to finding calmness. Um, but really, it's the engineer's guide to seeing life more spiritually, but in a way that you can understand it, even if it's through models that may not be the truth. You can say, ah, yeah. oh, that's how quantum physics work. Ah, oh, that's how God might work. That's how this yeah. might work. So you've got but these you little stepping stones. So, so, so you had these two clarities on like, okay, I want to be calm because then I can access happiness easily yeah. and other states from being calm. I can go anywhere. And I, I have this innate kind of leadership dominance authority that I want to like run things that will help a lot of people and what's best. And I want to yeah. be in integrity with that. Not in an, in an, in an asshole way, jerk way, but in integrity with that. And so, like, you those start doing exposure therapy on yourself, and like, what can I do to step closer in those to to those parts of myself that is aligned with what I am? Yeah. So I um, <laughs> so uh, so I read this dominance. I also realized that I had this playfulness, this cheekiness, this rule breakingness that for some reason when I was a kid I just couldn't I just couldn't break rules. I had to follow the rules. It was so ingrained in me. Whereas my brother would break all the rules and he was hilarious, really funny, carefree, a bit like my dad. And I was a bit like my mum, sort of, you know. And um, so I just started breaking rules and doing things I shouldn't do. And 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 um, why? Because I wanted my unconscious to get used to the fact that A, you can do it, and B, to see what would happen. Because my brain would say, if you do this, then that will happen. So I would consciously say, well, 
let's do it and see what does happen. Okay, and, you go that, do and it wouldn't happen. And, and what would happen was so different to what my unconscious brain said would happen, but it was quite funny. Right. So it started. That, that right there is worth a whole thing of doing things that your brain says, no, we shouldn't, can't, bad things will happen because that, yeah. that we're breaking our own beliefs very consciously, yeah. deliberately that way. That's like a fast track. And once I uh, saw, yeah, once I saw consciously that my unconscious was just arbitrarily about, made up limitations. Yeah, yeah, pretty, you know, and I used to believe, oh, you can't yeah. do that. Right. Yeah. And, and rather than saying, well, all right. And so then, then, then it's like, game on. Then yeah. you're like, okay, whole new game on. What else does it say I can't do? Yeah. So now I was now, whoa. Okay. So what I decided was that the, the playful side of me would just break rules and push boundaries and see how far I can push things. Okay. As, as exposure therapy to see what would happen. Okay. And then the dominant side of me would decide which way my life wanted to go and try to push me in a dominant way towards that way of that way of life to see what would happen. It just opened up so many little adventures for me. I just, I just started doing stuff that I never used to do. And it, was, it became easy and interesting and funny. But then what happened was the playful side of me and the dominant side of me started to argue, right? Because the, the dominant side would go, we need to do this, do this, do this, do this. And my playful side would go, oh, oh let's just go down the pub. Let's go, and play, let's go and play snooker with your mates. Okay, let's go and go, go yeah, just, just bunk off work for the day you know just lay in bed all day okay and my dominant is no no we've got these things to do and so they had this fight between these two aspects of these two new aspects of myself which weren't new they were there in my childhood but had been suppressed by my childhood right. yeah i'd never yeah. learned to be dominant i never learned they were, they were there and that's what made me angry when i was a child because i couldn't express myself i had to do what everybody thought i should do rather than what i wanted to do um and that and that suppressed leading and expressing what you want and suppress the oh, play yeah and causing all this angst yeah. inside of me and this okay. conflict inside of me which means you have to go and do the ocd things to calm yourself down yeah so i then learned that these two characters although they're very different within me they could become friends so yeah and that's it they were on the same team and they were really quite useful skills but they they had to befriend each other so my warrior would say listen Monday to Friday, we're going to work hard. And my fun side would go, I don't want to, right? And he said, no, but if you work hard Monday to Friday, Friday night through Sunday, you can do what you like and I'm going to shut up. Right? But there are some boundaries. Don't cross this one, don't cross this one. But in between, yeah, you can do yeah, what you like. Yeah. And he would go, woohoo. So Friday to Saturday, I can't do what I like. <laughs> and, and then Monday, I'd be serious again. And I started to get this realization that there are many aspects of me. Yeah. And neither are better and neither are worse. Some are more comfortable, but they all have a role. So I became okay with my introvert and I, I became okay with my extrovert. I became okay being quiet and I became okay being loud. I became okay being helpful and okay being selfish. I just, I don't know, I just started saying, how could I learn to be more versatile without listening to my stories and not listening to my feelings? I remember working, I had a client uh, a couple of years ago. Okay, hold on, hold on a second. You're not listening to your stories. You're not listening to feelings. What are you paying attention to? Well, to access what's playfulness, yeah, yeah, what's well, what work, what's other aspects. As I stopped listening to my thoughts and my feelings, um, two things came to the fore. The first one was, what do you want from life and who do you want to become? That became a real guiding where would you in my life where would you say that came from that's that's a soul that's a purpose that's a yeah it, consciousness it's i would say it's a conscious desire at that time okay yeah but just I, listen pay I attention to desire to which in a way is it isn't the way we think of listening but it's you're paying attention inward and sensing yeah this this feeling and what it wants yeah back then i had no frame of reference for it and and yeah. uh, but it it um I knew. Yeah, but we have to, we have to, people listen and go, listen, yeah. you know, and they think it's listening the conventional way. It's like, no, listen, no, no, it's paying no, no, attention no, no, no. to a certain no. sensation I and desire. Paper, yeah. What I thought I desired. But in reality, what I was writing down is what I didn't want. I don't want this job I got at the moment. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want this. And if I tried to write down all the things I did want, I didn't know what they were. 
No, but that that I don't want list is placed. So I took all the things I didn't want and I reversed them. So if I don't want this job, then I do want another job. Okay. Now that story, I don't want this job versus the other story, I do want another job. One is keeping you stuck with something that you don't want, and the other one is taking you towards something else. I do. Yeah, want it's job. it's yeah, you're changing the direction yeah. of yeah. where your focus is. Yeah, yeah. excellent. I, I don't want anxiety. Well, I do okay. want calmness. Okay, well, so what behaviors might give you calmness? So that that gave me the sort of direction I wanted to go, although I didn't know which way to go. Because I was doing the ERP, I was realizing that my brain would say, you can't do that. But when I went and did it, I could do it. So actually, I didn't have to listen to my thoughts. Right? I also knew that when I went to do the ERP thing, I was anxious. But when I did it, the world didn't end. Okay, And afterwards, I felt good, which also showed me that my feelings didn't have to mean anything. So you felt anxious as you were going to do it. Felt fine while doing it and afterwards felt good. Yeah. Good. You, you, then this is good to track the details because people people will need to know to break it up that way. It's okay. I feel bad going, just thinking about going to it. Fine. But how do you feel doing it? Okay. How do you feel after? It's like important to nail down the specifics and, and make note of it so you remember. Yeah. So I was the mind will fixate on what just feels bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm, so I was. I was, <laughs> I was learning to not believe my unconscious thoughts. I was learning to believe that my body was just responding to those thoughts. If I was running scary thoughts, then I would get scary feelings. It's kind of obvious, really. Okay. Yeah. And then if, those, I, if I believe scary thoughts, I get scary feelings. Yeah. Yeah. You but, know, if you have, I don't sexy believe thoughts, you have sexy feelings, if happy thoughts, you have happy <laughs> feelings. Okay. It's like kind of, you know. So therefore, so how do you stop having scary thoughts? Okay. Well, if they're coming from your unconscious. It's hard to stop them because they're just programs that are running. So you have to change those programs. <laughs> so you see it slowly unfolds it as you go through. Yeah. All right. So you're doing um, this process. You're changing the direction. And then, how long ago was it? Or how, how far into? This is wait, twenty-five years ago. Twenty-five yes. years ago, you're doing all this. Okay. I'm, I'm fifty-nine now. This is when I was like thirty-five or so. Yeah. Um. Um. And it's so funny looking back because I'm, I'm a completely different person. I know. When yeah. well, you it's know, funny, you, it's funny to hear you talk. Change. You've watched yeah, change. I, I, well, I I didn't know you even in the beginning because you came to events, you came to retreats, but yeah, I didn't I sit. To, I came to about eight or nine of your retreats in Mexico. Yeah, over the yeah. course of however many years. Yeah, and and I, but I didn't sit down with you. I didn't even know that you had these issues. Were working through any of this? I, I didn't. I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> 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 you wouldn't even know my shit. <laughs> so no, no, no. You're this. <laughs> so 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 to say, oh, I've known you. No, I knew this facade of you in a way. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mask, the mask ten, I was wearing. At that yeah, time. you're the mask you were wearing. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite clever. Uh, um. So one of the next things came up was uh, working with my therapist. Um. And he started to talk to me about my mind. And we talked about this a couple of days ago. And um, we, we don't have time to go there. Oh, I don't know. That's, that's a whole separate thing. We start talking about the mind and how do you want to divide it up? But Oh, my God. Yeah. That's, <laughs> we, okay. can, we, can, we can do this long series. Uh, but if I, if I just sort of close it off, okay. Yeah. What he said to me is, John, do you believe in God? And I said, no, when you die, game over. And he said, oh, that must be scary. I said, what? He said, thinking that when you die, boof, it's all over. Everything wasted. Everything's gone. You've lost everything. That must be terrifying. And I went, well, yeah, half my anxiety is, you know, fear of flying is a fear of crashing. You know, fear of driving is a fear of crashing. You know, it's actually kind of, you know, fear of killing someone is because you'll be in prison and someone's going to kill you. Okay. And he went, oh, that's horrible. Yeah. No wonder. No wonder you're anxious. And I said, well, well, what are you supposed to do if you don't believe in something else afterwards? Then what are you supposed to do? And he went, John, for an intelligent guy, you're really stupid. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, let's say that consciously you believe that when you die, it's game over. 
you can train your unconscious mind to believe there's something afterwards. Because the unconscious mind just runs the programs that it's programmed by if you can break the old program. He said, so therefore, what might be sensible, he said, I'm telling you what to do, but you should do whatever you want to do, but if you can program your unconscious mind to believe there is something afterwards, like the body dies, but your soul goes on, then your unconscious mind's going to go, oh, right? And it's going to stop asking you 10,000 questions and it's going to stop trying to keep you safe. Because actually, there is no safe. The body dies, but you go on. So actually, you are you are immortal, timeless. And um, how cool is that? What's there to worry about? Okay. Yeah. And you program your unconscious. And this was just like a practical approach. Program your yeah. unconscious this way so that you can enjoy your life more. Yeah. And so he says to me, John, don't worry if there is or isn't something as an afterlife. But it might be sensible for you to consciously program your unconscious mind to think there is. Yeah, you can have a much better life in this that. one, even if it's only finite. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? That makes complete sense, right? Because if my unconscious mind thinks that death is not the end, well, then it's going to stop asking me 10,000 questions and it's going to stop trying to make me safe in its own version of safe, okay? I thought that's brilliant. So I, I bought a couple of spiritual books and I sort of read them and I went, oh, I, I get what they're saying. So I just program myself and program myself over and over erp 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 until one day i, I can't remember the incident but something came up and it just and what came up was well it doesn't matter if you die because you've got this other thing and then consciously i went oh my god it works how cool is your that thought, your, your, your thought came up that way just to yeah, rose yeah, oh, yeah. it doesn't matter if you die you'll be fine because you got this other, oh my god and, and then i went oh my god that's brilliant but in the con in the in the course of reading all these books to program my unconscious mind I started going, well, actually, there's something in all of this, okay? Whereas my engineering side wanted all the proof, prove that there's a God, prove that there's intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. I suddenly realized that that's my left my left brain wanting all the facts and reasons, but my whole right brain is connected to this stuff. And it was, you know, I'd just been blocked off from the whole thing. And that's what got me involved in the spiritual side of things. And that's when I met you, opened up a whole other world, okay? And then... Um, uh, and then as that world has got bigger and bigger now, I mean, I'm, a, I'm now a, a stealth spiritual teacher. I, I te As an engineer, I teach people how to become spiritual without using the word spirit or God or anything else. And by talking in ways that are common sense to get someone to move to optimism and trust and to calmness and choice. And, and, and yeah. So what, yeah, what is, what is that, that spiritual, what does that spiritually look, spiritual look like or feel like? Because yeah, it's calmness, it's trust trust in life, yeah. loving, compassionate, yeah. you know, and, okay, do do that whether you believe, because you have a better life, yeah, whether, you, whether you believe or not. any deity or not deity. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, um, I, I, I've experienced enough now so many times that I have no doubt that there is something else. I've, I've been there, I've experienced it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have no doubts, okay. Mm -hmm. and it took me 10 years into my journey until I had the first experience. And, and in fact, the first experience I had on one of your retreats in North Carolina, I had an ecstasy moment that lasted six hours and I couldn't talk. I just cried for six hours. I sat on the sofa looking out the window over the sea and I couldn't move for six hours in just complete bliss. And at the end of that, I went, OK, I want more of that. What else do I need to let go of? What else do I need to move forward? And since then, I've had all sorts of things happen in my life. And I, and I talk about them in, in my in my, um, my videos and in my, my calmness course. And um, um, see, again, didn't know. You kept all this secret. Yeah. And um, <laughs> the um, that sort of, sort of, sort of to put the, the, the final bit into a sort of little metaphor. I personally now, and I teach this in my course, I don't see myself as my body. So if I'm talking to you, I say, my, my hand hurts. If I'm talking to myself, I say, the hand hurts. Yeah. Or the brain Similar. just gave me a thought. Hmm? Yeah. So what, okay? The body is hungry. The body feels sexy. The body feels thirsty or whatever. And just because it feels thirsty doesn't mean I have to give it water. It just means it feels thirsty, okay? Yeah, it's just, so, so what, okay, within reason. So I see myself as my soul, and um, I'll find whatever word you like. My soul to me is formless, it's a formless energy. It comes into 
the fetus sometime that it's growing, okay? And my soul is the rider of my little horse. So I see my body as the little horse and my soul is the rider of the horse. My soul can't control my horse because it's a self-running little thing, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. right? But it can ride the horse and it can influence the horse. The horse is going to die and my soul is not and it's going to go on to something else. My job on this planet as a soul is to learn everything I can learn through the experiences of the body and to be able to be okay with love and grief and fear and whatever it may be, okay? And I personally don't care if my horse is scared or whatever or even if my horse is tired, okay? I still get up and go and do the things I want to do because my rider controls the horse. It's not the horse controlling the rider. And this is and this is very fits very well with exposure therapy. You have this horse, you have this animal body you're riding, and it's like, okay, I want to teach it to jump. You start with the little jumps and work your way up. I want to teach it to be able to cross the river. Okay, I got to start with shallow streams, and I take it to deeper water until it can cross big rivers. It's like it's going to trust has to learn to trust the rider as well. Absolutely. And you need to learn to be gentle with the horse, horse and give it as much as it can handle, but not too much. You know, Never. And, and just and just for other people who who have listened to my other podcasts and what I've talked about recently, what John's describing is the soul and the soul. Uh, that's probably interchangeable with the word I use as consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. OK. And, and, I, and, I, and, and for, for me, they're they're different. But I'll, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. yeah, it's just some I mean, I mean, and, and semantics. The, the truth is nobody knows what all this is. OK. And everybody's got their story. And, and I'm OK with a metaphor that kind of points yeah. to truth whatever yeah. the truth is yeah. for me my soul is connected to consciousness so yes. um, yeah so if i'm in a soul positionality like if i'm meditating i seem then to be able to connect with consciousness ideas come to me um yeah the vast uh, field the vast like, field of like an aerial where stuff can come through me i mean yeah. that's a whole another 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 thing yeah. but i talk about this in my videos um okay. um I think the okay. trouble with people with anxiety and OCD, and I, obviously I mean this very respectfully because I've been there, um, the horse is calling the shots, okay? And yeah. all the time the horse is calling the shots and saying, no, I'm not going out today. I'm staying in the stable. Or I can't, I can't go in that stable because that horse bullies me. And I can't go in that stable because there's a mouse in there. I'll only go in this stable because it's the one that's, I don't know. Then the rider's going to flounder and the, and, and the soul is not going to have the experience that it is on this planet to have. And you're going to wake up sometime when you're 40, 50, 60 or 70 and suddenly go, shit, I've missed my whole life. And that's, to me, that's hell, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and, you know, and um, that helped me a lot to move to a, this rider this perspective. Meta metaphor being the rider of the horse. It's like, I have, to, I have to coax it out and go on with my life because that's going to be better for both. Yeah. The rider the and the horse. thing that, that links it all together is if you can spend a lot of time as the rider, not the horse, you can ERP and reprogram the horse. You can get it to calm down. You can retrain it. You can desensitize yeah. it. You've got clear ideas of where you want to go. What then happens is what you find is, if you throw in a bit of meditation as well, is that suddenly you have an intuition. It's like the horsey then is dialed into the environment that it's in. And if it goes over this way, it just feels that this person's wrong or it just feels that this way is right. And suddenly you have this feeling inside you, which you might call intuition, that is like this magnet that nature pulls you towards that which is good for you. And it repels you from that which is bad from you underneath and, your emotions and, and underneath your thoughts of the of the creature. And you're and you're working with this. Yeah. horse this being in a symbiotic way yeah. call it nature call it divinity call it what you will yeah. it doesn't matter call it a giant electromagnetic yeah. force it doesn't matter but it's yeah. there and, and then it's much it bigger and powerful lines. much oh. bigger and powerful than you can think and once you've connected with that you're in a whole different energy field and that energy field changes everything about you and it recharges you because people with anxiety depression ocd they have no energy Okay, and as they move into these higher energy fields, um, they become recharged and then they can use that charge to go towards the things they want to do. So it moves them out of procrastination and um, fear, doubt, and um, just sitting at home, stuck. Yeah, being stuck. So yeah. just 
flashing on the kind of like where you are and the energy you're living in now and your sense of life and adventure. But two things. One, you talk about OCD as a superpower now. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And two, uh, what's the program you put together for people who have anxiety and OCD and where can they find it? Yeah, uh, good questions. First one. Because... Um, you're the expert. You lived it. You lived going. You lived what it was like being stuck in it. You lived what it was like in being, feeling hopeless, and you lived through all the details of how to change it for yourself. And now you have, I don't know, how many experiences guiding other people through it as well from yeah, top so, to bottom. Yeah. So as a as a engineer, sales director, I, I walked away from all of that. Um, I think in two thousand and six or two thousand and seven, and then um, I thought to myself. You know, I I'm, I'm, haven't completely got myself up, but I got myself functioning. I got myself seeing things differently. I'm back on my feet again. Um, so I, I decided to become a therapist. And um, and I wanted to work with anxiety and OCD, thinking that there wouldn't be many people out there with anxiety and OCD. <laughs> it's all about naivety. Okay. <laughs> so, um, turns out there was. <laughs> I, made, I made this website. I made this website talking about all my experiences. Okay. And then people would come to my, my johnglanville.com website and they would come to there and they would go, oh my God, he, he's talking about that thing that I've got. So people just instantly started coming to see me um, um, and a therapy practice group, um, but only working with really complex people that had the worst anxiety and the worst OCD. So they tried everything before they, they came to me. So um, uh, it kind of really put me through my paces, having to be able to teach people, understand it and, and so on. So um, over the next you know, 15 years, I learned a lot about OCD and anxiety and I saw all the patterns and, and everything else. But to answer your question, I do see OCD as a superpower. If you are obsessive, you can use that obsession in ways that benefit you or you can use that obsession in ways that tie you up and restrict you. You, know, you could be washing your hands for six hours a day or you could be programming something for six hours a day, yeah. Or you could reprogram. You, you could reprogram yeah. your unconscious for six hours yeah, a day. Exactly. Yeah. You could be doing ERP for six hours a day. You know what I mean? If you've got your own company, you can spend. You could be writing for six hours per day. You you can use obsessions constructively, and, mm. and the most obvious example of that, I think, is is Elon Musk. He, he's completely OCD, but he's only OCD about the things that he's interested in and the things that take his three companies forward and anything else he doesn't want to think about because, yeah. so it's still a bit too obsessive, okay? I like the I like the concepts that um, work eight hours, play eight hours and sleep eight hours. That's, that's, that's right, if you want balance, okay? Right. And be obsessive about working eight hours, sleeping eight hours and, uh, and playing eight hours, okay? And when you're playing, you haven't got to be obsessive, okay? And when you're working, you don't always have to be obsessive, but when it's useful, then fair enough, go do it. But certainly become obsessive about understanding yourself. Become obsessive about ERP and become obsessive about who you wish to become and what you wish to do for a period long enough for you to become on that path. And then you can let go of that obsession and become obsessed about something else. Um, I now can turn on and turn off my obsessions. And I can you, choose to become obsessive and I can choose to let go of it. So it's, you're just learning a bigger skill set of becoming whoever or, or becoming all you can be. Yeah. Still more comfortable being an introvert than an extrovert, but I can be an extrovert for eight hours and then, yeah, then it's yeah. much enough to calm down again. It, does, it doesn't stop you. You take the hearse out of the barn, you come here, you show up on my podcast and you're like, yeah. here I am. Yeah, exactly. And apparently not shy, you know, holding back. I, I used to be unbelievably shy and now I'm not shy. I, I just, I am what I am now. I, I don't need a lot of people. Um, and then finally, um, after being a therapist for um, however many years, and by being somebody who continuously exposes myself to new experiences so that I have my empirical experience of what happened to me. Um, you know, I've been on your retreats, I've been on various other retreats, I've traveled all around the world and loads and loads of different things. Um, and what I did four years ago is I started documenting everything I'd learned in a video series 
right from first principles about how I see the brain working, how thoughts, where they come from, values, beliefs, personality types, how ERP works. And I every month I create a new video about my experiences and everything I've learned about anxiety and OCD. And although it's aimed at anxiety and OCD, really anybody who's looking for personal growth would benefit from my experiences. And I only talk about things that I've experienced what it did for me, how it empowered me. And I try to explain it in ways that um, that make sense to people with videos and animations and so on. And, um, well, and it's, it's, high, that, it's high quality stuff. Thank you. Yeah, and I sell that for um, $7 a month uh, as a subscription uh, on my Patreon website. Yeah. And they pay $7 a month and they have access to all of it. The access to, yeah, at the moment there's over 50 videos and most of them are now over an hour long. And there's blogs of me talking about my experiences and, uh, um it's 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 for it's for thinkers who really want to get models that allow them to see life differently so they can go and try it then drop that model find their own model then drop that model get that model it's giving structure to a spiritual life which often many spiritual searchers have so many questions well what is the spirit and what is the soul and how do they fit together and how does energy work and all those things and although i haven't got all the answers i've got my my experience put into models that kind of models you know, that, and practices that, that yeah. inform the whole brain, because what we were taught growing up as a model yeah. is, you know, we can't, we can't expect to go live adult in, in a complex world with what my eight year old self used and learned. And no, it needs an upgrade, a serious upgrade. It's, it's like giving the, 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 the intellectual left brain thinker, the right tool, tools to access the right brain that has all yeah. these incredible yeah. superpowers. And uh, uh, and that's where, if you think about what most people are looking for, they're looking for love, they're looking for connection, intimacy, purpose, meaning. They're the things that they're looking for. But you try to define what those things are, you can't put them into, into uh, equations, okay? Right? And the logical, rational mind goes, yeah, well, what is love? And how do you get love? And well, yeah. these are the wrong questions. Uh, um, yeah. These are experiences. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then how do you get, to get those experience? experiences by going out and grasping right. those 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 experiences? So, so uh, yours okay. yours is arranged these videos in depth, uh, every detail. You're amazingly thorough. Uh, all the very practical how to work through anxiety, belief systems, emotions, understanding your personalities, yeah. uh, work, worksheets, worksheets, oh, worksheets, practices. There's, uh, there's, med- there's guided. It's meditation. a life. It's a yeah. life changing course. It's everything Wait, I've learned. And, and and into words and videos, and you keep adding to it, and they can find it where. It's um, it's it's www.patreon.com uh, forward slash the anxiety specialist, all one word. But we'll put the, it in the notes. Below. The anxiety specialist, and your website is my website is just uh, johnglanville.com. So there probably is a link over to the Patreon yeah, site from there. there. Okay, um, and we'll put it in the notes. That was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for giving me a chance to. Uh, talk about my world appreciate it and thank you for, um, i haven't said it here but the, the the role that you've played in in helping me to understand the mind to let go to get into meditation to understand energy through the uh the trips to teo teotihuacan in mexico um uh quite amazing and um yeah and i'm coming to the one this october so um, you're coming to, yeah yeah you got you got more something specific consciously you're intending there yeah, yeah. We're, well, Jen and I, we're getting married in the beginning of September. And then in October, we're coming to Mexico and we're going to get married again on top of the pyramid. Pyramid of the sun, place of place of great energy. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Some Thank magic, you for your, magic. Thank you for your role in my, uh, my growth. It's been um, profound. It's been a pleasure to have you and now really getting to know you <laughs> <laughs> without the mask. It's yeah. even better. It was good with the with the mask. It's even better now. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, anything else, my friend? Oh, wonderful! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, continue to enjoy your company and look forward to having you uh, and Jan in Mexico. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I love you very much. Thank you. You too, man. Take care. This is Gary Van Wormerdam with the Awareness and Consciousness Podcast from pathwaytohappiness.com. And uh, you can find all the links to John Glanville's work in the show notes and to my course and about the power journeys to Mexico and other events on my website, pathwaytohappiness.com. Peace be with you.